come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a movie talk show podcast where we talk amongst ourselves. Not to anybody like who's actually been in a movie. Just us, the internet radio superstars. We'll introduce those them in a second. But first of all, we want to ask you to do us a great big favor. Go over to wherever you found us and hit that like or subscribe button. Hit the little bell for notifications Whatever you have to do, because all that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you and uh, help us become the fastest growing movie podcast in the galaxy, the universe, and beyond. To infinity and beyond. These are the internet radio superstars. Michaela. Holly. Sean. (laughs) And I'm Colin. Yeah, I know. We got to work on the order here. We are still. really do. In quarantine. I was just assumed. I was just assumed that we would do it as if we were sitting downstairs. So I would go second to last, and then Colin would go last. So oh, I figured I it'd be Sean McKay- that without us sitting there. Really? <laughs> I figured it'd be Sean, Michaela, me, Colin. But that's just me. Whatever. Boom. Oh, it's fine. There the only you go. person that's like in their designated spot is whose movie it is. Otherwise, we could be sitting in any order. Right. Because Holly, <laughs> to, the last to go though. To me, it's always Michaela, Holly, Sean, and I'm Colin. Like that is the order. It is always. I'm glad in, our in my head. Are hearing this <laughs> off my conversation. Well, there you go. We're welcoming <laughs> you we were behind. For a that's second. right. <laughs> in total transparency, behind the scenes of the Saturday Night Freak Show on. Uh, uh, whatever quarantine edition month three week 56. Or yeah week 56 um so anyway tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by holly uh holly what did we watch tonight tonight we went to congo we went to the congo <laughs> in the year 1995 and uh directed by frank marshall and how would we know him are we putting uh, frank marshall almost- on the wall Almost three years ago, exactly, with just a couple weeks, we watched Arachnophobia, also by Frank Marshall. That was his um, feature debut as a director. Yes. Which also uh, he's Stuart also Pankin in it. Yes. <laughs> Stuart Pankin, also in Congo. What else is Frank Marshall known for? Uh, he's also known for Alive, 1993. Oh, the movie where they eat each other. Yep. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it looks eight like below, he did some... eight below is the other one he directed. I think he's only done those four movies. Am I wrong? Yeah, as far as Alive, directing Congo goes, and... he hasn't done a whole lot. He did more producing than directing. Well, he's famous as a producer. How come? Yeah. Oh God, where do I start with producing? 1982, the beginning. Well, I mean, he worked obviously with like uh, uh, Walter Hill and Martin Scorsese prior to that. But I mean, like the big thing is 1982. He co-founded Amblin Entertainment with his wife, uh, Kathleen Kennedy. And who? Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. Yeah. I was waiting for somebody else to come. Like Spielberg. It's Amblin. Spielberg. (laughs) So that means that Frank Marshall is responsible for, uh, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Poltergeist, Back to the Future, Color Purple, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Cape Fear, Hook. Then he did Six Sense, Signs, the Bourne movies, the Jurassic Park movies, the Jurassic World movies. Bam. Yeah. Yep. Did the money pit. He did the money pit. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's I movies I didn't movies. mention there, but yeah, Frank Marshall is a fixture, a titan. Yes. In uh, in the you know the Hollywood movie system, and uh, became a director with Arachnophobia. You said, "Is he on the wall uh, of fame, the Saturday Night Free Show Wall of Fame?" Um, I don't know if we've ever counted producers. I don't think we have. We just. I know. think we have. I don't think we have. I mean, we've done, we've done, uh, I mean, cause uh, technically we've owned, this is his second movie that, that he directed that we've watched, that we've watched on the show. But obviously, you know, as a producer, we've done both back to the future movies. We've done Jurassic park I mean, you know, et cetera. We did. Roger Hook. Rabbit. Yeah. yeah. So we did a lot of his movies. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to have another off mic conversation about the bylaws of if you produced a movie, do you qualify for the Saturday night freak show wall of fame? Um, Who's in this movie? 
Or actually, oh, no. isn't in this movie, Colin. <laughs> I was gonna, should we should we first go with uh, we're going with the creative team? Should we mention who uh, who wrote the novel upon which it is based? Um, it is a Michael Crichton novel. Of course it is. And who's he? <laughs> who's his and, name? Uh, the screenplay was written by John Patrick Shanley. Okay. He, yeah, I'm not sure. What else has uh, Patrick Shanley done? Patrick Shanley is a Oscar winner. He won a couple years ago for Doubt. He oh, wrote man. he wrote and directed that, and he's That's done a really good movie. Yeah, it was a really good movie, and uh, yeah, he won the Oscar for that. Um, he also did, um, as far as directing goes, he's done some things, um, but he's written a lot. I think. I feel um, like that movie gets overlooked a lot for being a good Philip Seymour Hoffman performance. That was a great fucking movie. I yeah. He has so many good performances that people forget about that one, but that mm. is one of his best. For sure. Um, yep. Shanley was, he only directed three movies, uh, Doubt being one of them, and then another one being one of my favorite movies, Joe vs. the Volcano. Get out. Oh, no. Really? That's a big gap. Love- I fucking love that movie. Oh, wow. uh, but he's written he's written a lot. He he's famous for writing um um Moonstruck was like his first big um big breakout as a writer. Um obviously he did Congo, he did Doubt, um and he's done a few other things in between. Alive. He he uh he worked with Frank Marshall on Alive as well. Okay. So yeah. a few big ones in there. Yeah. That's an impressive resume. Uh, yeah. Michael Crichton, he, uh, of course, is probably best known right now as the creator of uh, Jurassic Park, right? Or yeah. maybe the TV show ER. Um, I looked him up, you know, just to get a little backstory, because, I mean, he's another he's an author and a filmmaker. He's been involved uh, in movies since the 70s and in, in novels since the 60s. Uh, he's a guy. So. I mean, the story always is that Michael Crichton at one point was like a doctor, right? And then uh, then used that information to, to create the show ER. Uh, he was uh, he was only in medical school for like three weeks, and then he hated it so much that he quit. But he has a bachelor's degree in biological anthropology. That's what he went to Harvard for. Oh, wow. Uh, and then he became an author. But the, the funny thing about Michael Crichton is, and I guess he directed shitty robot movies. What? Westworld is a goddamn class. OK. <laughs> <laughs> you remember the box robot with the gun? Yeah. Yeah. The little spider robots. Go back and listen yeah. to our runway, our runaway episode. We've also done. Uh, we also did Westworld. So this may put Michael Crichton on the uh, wall of fame. But the funny thing is, maybe you don't know this because I didn't know this. So, like, uh, he didn't write his first batch of novels under his own name. He used a bunch of pseudonyms for the first few novels. The first one that he actually published under his own name was a movie called the, or sorry, a novel called The Andromeda Strain. Mm, uh, right. Which is about a, like, a, a, a satellite, I think, brings a, 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 I don't know if it's a virus, it's a microorganism. That makes your blood clot in like 12 minutes. <laughs> this or something sounds like, like that. virus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he also wrote, uh, he wrote Eaters of the Dead. That uh, Viking mo- uh, story uh, was made into the 13th Warrior. Uh, he wrote Congo. He wrote Sphere, Jurassic Park, Rising Sun, Disclosure, The Lost World, among others. Uh, then he became like a film director, which is one of those things that's like, how do you do, how do you go from being a novelist to becoming a filmmaker? In the 70s, it was kind of like, you know, sure, you know how to do this, right? I mean, you've never done it before, but whatever. But he made uh, Westworld. He directed a movie called Coma that was not based on his book. That was based on a book by uh, Robin Cook. Uh, oh, he I've made, seen that movie. Yeah, it's still regarded, I think. They made like a mini series remake uh, a couple of years ago oh, on like okay. A&E. Uh, it's very creepy. Yeah. Uh, he also made The Great Train Robbery with um, uh, Sean Connery. He made Looker, Runaway. Um, apparently he did, thir- he did reshoots on the 13th warrior and, uh, he wrote Twister along with his, uh, fourth wife, Anne Marie Martin, who you may remember Indeed. from prom night. She was in prom night. So there you go. Boom. Trivia. Boom. Didn't I know was, uh, that Michael was Crichton was one of people magazines, 50 most beautiful people in 1992. 
Really? I told you. Bam, you know, Colin, you for a second there, I thought you were going to do a Michael Crichton Chuck Norris joke. <laughs> I don't know why. Don't Is worry. Like, we, did you know? We have mailbag coming up later. The, the Chuck oh, Norris God. machine is not done I yet. I can't say I know what Michael Crichton looks like, honestly. No, no, I was just thinking that. I was like, I have no idea what that dude looks like. Like, I don't even know what his author picture looks like, honestly. Well, you're going to have speaking to take of, my word for it, I guess. Speaking of uh, he is dead, speaking of knowing what, knowing what people look like, did you catch who played the pilot in this movie of the jet that took them to Congo? No. It was, no. It was Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> What? Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, he's Lord. a Crichton cameo regular, isn't he? Jimmy Buffett. Well, there you oh, remember no. his horrible cameo in Jurassic World. Oh, <laughs> he's carrying yeah. margaritas. Yeah, yeah, in front of Margaritaville. It couldn't have been more like on the fucking nose if they tried. Yeah. All I know is that the the KC masterpiece guy was driving the truck when they were at the airport. That's all I'm. That's all the cameos I know about. Well, this movie has a <laughs> shocking number of recognizable faces. He's not a bad looking man. Who? I can't I can't really tell. You're, it's all like pixelated and shit. Oh, he gonna... looks like Stallone and Tango and Cash in that picture. He does. He does. <laughs> he does exactly. The glasses and like the really buttoned up suit. Oh my God. Well, unfortunately, oh, he still looks like Stallone I know. and Tango. He yeah. really does. He really he does. Cash. That's funny. Unfortunately, he <laughs> passed away. It was lymphoma is what he died of in uh, 2008. Aww. Michael Crichton. Mm. Uh, oh, that's yeah. sad. It's sad. Uh, wait, do we, was he an asshole? I don't remember. Like, was Not he? Uh, yeah. Did he have some thoughts on the world that weren't exactly kosher? I don't remember. Uh, I don't he know. died a long ass time ago. So yeah, yeah. Who knows? Time, uh, we won't look that up. So, um, so who's in this movie? Then we're talking about like all the famous faces, but I mean, uh, who who's the main folks in? Congo. Uh, our main characters are Laura Linney and Dylan Walsh, Ernie Hudson, Tim Curry. A uh, brief cameo at the very beginning from Mr. Bruce Campbell. That's right. Screen legend Bruce Campbell is in this movie for all five minutes. That's actually what I remember about this movie. I remember Bruce Campbell's at the beginning and there's killer gorillas at the end. Although I thought there were killer yeah, he- gorillas in a lot more of the movie. <laughs> Those are the highlights, I would say, Colin. Yeah, I got to tell you, on this rewatch, I was very surprised. This was almost a different movie than I uh, thought I was getting into. I haven't I seen agree. this since I remember opening Rainbow night. Gorillas. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's what you take away uh, from it. Yeah, there's like mutant gorillas, a talking ape, and uh, Bruce Campbell. Nintendo yeah. Power Glove that translates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, all these I things you're saying. Like just a lot. Right, me too. But all the things yeah. you're saying are just like I'd watch that movie. Right. Like, yeah. Oh, right. There's also uh, we get into the political state of an African country and the There's warrings that. going on there. There's that whole thing uh, that happens for a while. Um, yeah. Then we get to gorillas, kind of. The we gorillas. Say, I oh, thought this time oh. around was almost like an afterthought. It was like that was just another step on this. So so Congo is basically um, on this watch anyway because maybe the ads for it. I have to go back and watch a trailer for this. Like, did they set it up as it was basically going to be like these people go to the Congo and are set upon by like these uh, gray gorillas? Yes, because I remember it specifically this trailer. Okay, and I remember when we watched it tonight. I remember all the trailer moments from it, and it was very Here. heavy. We are oh. watching you, gray gorillas, dude falling yeah. down the stairs screaming. Yeah, this was the killer I'll, I'll gorilla tell you, movie. I'll tell you the tagline of this movie, and that should answer your question. The, it, it was Congo, where you are the endangered species. Okay, okay. That should tell you. Yeah, I, I seem to remember a lot of like eyes peering at you through the jungle, like kind of stalking sensation in like the marketing materials. Well, yeah. it's definitely the poster. The poster is Amy, the um, star gorilla from the movie. What makes Amy? Uh, so different from your average run-of-the-mill gorilla. She can talk, Colin. <laughs> She's animatronic. <laughs> Not only can she talk, she can insult. Yes. How does she, she do can. that? <laughs> Amy thinks you're ugly, Colin. <laughs> but how does she tell me? She has a Nintendo Power Glove that, what did they say, could like... I was I, this whole part, I was like, she I She does care. sign language, and the, sign, the glove it, interprets it that. It translates it, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, this is amazing. But a she technological would, she breakthrough. Wouldn't think that, she wouldn't think that Colin is ugly. She would call either you or me, Michaela. Oh, we would call one of us ugly. She's, yeah. she's jealous. Yeah. yeah. She's jealous. She would, yeah. she would love us. Colin, but I think she'd love you a lot. <laughs> well, don't I know? I mean, I'm. <laughs> but it's like that broken robotic kind of voice. And she starts every sentence with Amy this or Amy that, which is really unsettling. Yeah. Did anybody find it when they were showing the video of the guy who was using the glove and he gets all teary eyed and is like, this is the first time I've heard my voice. I'm like, dude, you get a shitty voice. Just calm yeah. down. Like it's a robot voice. <laughs> I yeah, know. It's now not, they it's can not your voice. Dude. Yeah, your voice. <laughs> a couple of years ago, they gave Roger Ebert his actual voice for a brief period of time there. That's how they far did. we've come. Um, so basically, okay. So we're talking about, maybe we have to break this movie up a little bit. There are three interested parties who all want to go into the Congo in Zaire, Zaire, right? This is where the action, I wouldn't even say the bulk of the action. The second half of the movie takes place there in the Congo. Um, but why let's go with like, so there's three stories. Why does each character want to go there? Let's start with the Amy story. So what's going on with her? Obviously she's a, um, uh, uh, scientific anomaly, right? Mm -hmm. So she's been equipped with this machine that can translate her. Uh, well, I, I guess they originally say like, right. They're like, this is a, a thing that can translate sign language into speech. And then they wow a crowd with like, you can actually animals can talk. Ladies and gentlemen, if they can learn sign language, they can speak to us. And Amy is the demonstration yeah. of this. Who's this right. guy uh, who is her keeper Lover? slash <laughs> love <laughs> interest? Lover slash caretaker slash yes. whatever appropriate boundaries shouldn't be crossed or being yes. crossed. Yeah. Who is this? He's a scientist. Uh, Dr. Peter Elliott, played by Dylan Walsh. Right. Who's from that Nip Tuck show, if you ever watch Nip Tuck. Um, the Stepfather remake. Oh, yeah, it's true. Was he the He's stepfather? The stepfather, oh, yeah. Okay. He's the stepfather. Stay tuned. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that either one of those would be good. I, well, you can't, I don't think you I've seen go them. with the original. If you haven't seen Amber Heard's in the remake. Oh, no. uh, um, so, so, uh, so, why does he want to go to the jungle? So basically, he is he has been working with Amy on communication and he's been working with her with the Nintendo glove uh, and sign language. He's taught her sign language and she's now communicating effectively with that. And also he's been working with her on different types of expressing herself, including painting and her paintings have evolved into basically her, her home, her, you know, where, where she's kept all all of the paintings have become basically like a jungle and he's t and dr elliot is taking that as a sign that it's time for her to go back to her natural habitat they never really do make like much did they say like where she how they got her because obviously she's an ape really. in captivity who was taken from this uh this volcanic mountain area in this valley and now, yeah, but because she can speak or she because found. she's dreaming about the jungle, it's like, we got to take her back. Thereby starting a multi-million dollar, I assume, enterprise to take this ape back to, or mm -hmm. sorry, gorilla back to the jungle. Mm. Yeah, which they, they briefly mentioned that, she, like, he... You know, when Dr. Elliot comes in and is like, oh, well, how was she tonight? Did she have any nightmares? And he's like, no, not nightmares. And he's like, oh, good girl. Um, in the book, that was really expanded on. There was like a whole thing in the book about Amy's dreams and her nightmares. And that was explored a lot more. Um, I didn't read I didn't read it. So I'm not sure <laughs> how that happened. I don't know. Why if not, she, Holly? Well, I don't know if she Cause she's got Wikipedia, Sean. Okay, I can see how that's unnecessary to the movie, but I'm more interested yeah. in that than what happens in the actual. Movie. I was like, hmm, I kind of want to know about these dreams because that like that helped that helped them realize, like, okay, she should go back to her national habitat. She's like dreaming about it and she's having these like visions about it. But I was hoping I, there was like a Freddy Krueger for gorillas that she's dreaming about. <laughs> <laughs> she's dreaming of the gray gorilla. 
The evil I'll gray bet, gorilla. Uh, I'll bet Peter found it out during pillow talk at night. She's like, no. I'd like, I'd like to go home. John, I, I need I, this. Vi- don't, this don't, vi- don't, don't, don't look at me. This is the movie that this movie does it, not me. I mean, we did see them in bed together. That's true. So. Okay. Well, <laughs> we, we got to tell the audience who isn't from like not like a, a, a well, you know, like a sexual thing. This is, but. <laughs> I mean, they, they sleep were camping together. in a tent together in the same bed, Colin. Okay, here's, here's the thing. You Usually, in mean, a movie like this, you let's, have at some point. Let's be real. Like, I, my cat sleeps in my bed. I know Sean's cat sleeps in his bed. Like, you dirty that's motherfucker. Like those animals don't have the same level of intelligence, <laughs> or it's closely related to us as gorillas. It's very true. So we're crossing all sorts of. Ethical Michaela, boundaries you sound like here. you're taking the argument for him. Like those sound like words he would say. <laughs> <I'm sure he laughs> <laughs> you, that's oh, how you would justify it she's practically right. human right she's like this close well this is the <laughs> weird thing about this movie because traditionally in these type of films you have um you know i mean i don't know i think maybe there's too many characters but i think maybe that you would have your leading man and he's got this ape that he's got to, or sorry the gorilla that he's got to take back to the the congo and then we'll meet the female protagonist and usually there's a relationship between them and yes i get that the you know but at least some kind of sexual tension and the gorilla is like the third party in this they kind of switch that around. up at the beginning and then they ignore it because there is no sexual tension it's just basically like this guy really loves his gorilla and the gorilla really loves him that's what the movie says. That's what the movie's about. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is a story. <laughs> the ending, especially. About a man and his gorilla named Amy. Yep. Um, yeah. But this is not Shape of Water, ladies and gentlemen. At this point, we're still it's saying close. bestiality is gross. <laughs> Just give Hollywood a couple more years. So, uh, so yeah, I don't think to be fair, a character does pockets. say they are like a married couple in this movie. More yeah, than one more character. Points that out. Yeah, and I think some of the guys uh, once they actually get to the Congo say that too. Um, okay, so uh, um, Amy was created by Stan Winston Studios, right? Um, so this is a fully animatronic face. I believe the um, the the woman who played it, Lola No, is actually underneath all that. Uh, you know. Well, it's not foam latex. I guess they the, the said that there was a breakthrough because they used silicone. This is one of the silicone, first times yeah. they used silicone molds instead of foam latex. Um, and obviously in years, I think this is why I keep saying ape, because in years, late subsequent years, uh, you know, we had the Planet of the Apes movies and you would do this with CGI. What did you guys think now looking back on a 1995 movie, like how well realized was uh, Amy? Uh, and the on-screen gorillas. I thought they were fine. I, yeah, I think they're fine. I mean, if they were, if we were to make a movie like that now, it'd be ridiculous. But looking back for '95, I'm like, yeah, that's actually not bad. I think they're they're mostly really good. There's something just slightly off about them that makes them uncanny valley, though. It was something like yeah. with the neck area and the way bit. the head moved a little bit just didn't quite look right. It was like 99 percent there. Okay. All right, yeah. And I thought I, I thought I saw that when they were being designed that they had envisioned the the set piece to be more um, more like hidden. So they they were viewing them like with more trees and more shadows, and they didn't expect them to be like in the cave where they're just fully exposed head on. Yeah, they were they were expecting to be able to use more lighting tricks and more camera tricks and that kind of thing to make them Some more menacing. Yeah, something, and they and then when it happened, that it was just a big open room. They're like, "Well, fuck, this isn't what we wanted at all." And brightly lit, so you can see. I mean, I don't know. I, I right. thought you know, you get a lot of close ups of Amy. I mean, she is one of the stars of the, or at least one of the central characters of the show. And uh, I was actually kind of impressed looking back on it. And like, I don't know. I mean, obviously, Caesar in uh, Planet of the Apes is um, super cutting edge, and I mean, that looks really good, but. I almost yeah. wonder if it's too human, you know, now you can, uh, you know, uh, you can make these things look maybe too expressive. Like I kind of almost, but not quite prefer the Congo thing. It's like a, a couple more years on that. And you have, I think like a believable gorilla, 
you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For I sure, do prefer yeah. there being an actual actor present, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Because, I mean, it's Maybe really just do expressive. Maybe suit and CGI the face, you know? Yeah, but even this, well, you're right. I mean, a little bit of enhancement or something, but I, this I thought was like a fairly expressive uh, animatronic face. I mean, it's better than what yeah. you see at like Rainforest Cafe or whatever, you know. You see some, <laughs> may, may it rest. That's your go to. I mean, that's not really it's better than line. Rainforest Cafe. <laughs> uh, put that on the poster, Colin. <laughs> there you go. You can quote the Saturday Night Freak Show. <laughs> Hey, when our local rainforest cafe goes out of business like it's supposed to, we should buy all the animatronic animals and make a movie. I thought, I, I think thought it's it already, already did. Yeah, it already did. did it? January I mean, 1st. What is, but like, is that stuff still around? Like, yeah, let's go find the dumpsters uh-huh. behind back. Yeah, let's and make they, a movie they can with do those. it with a T Rex. We can do it. Yeah, yeah. there's some, there's something really nostalgic about walking by a rainforest cafe and the smell. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was actually so legitimately so sad when they said they were closing. Yeah, I was like, me that's too. A problem. I was like, yeah, their food's shit, but the ambiance is amazing. Yeah, it is a really <laughs> cool place if you've yeah. never been to a rainforest cafe. The smell she's talking about, that's like the, uh, whatever they use for the mist. There's a mist, yeah. Yeah, there's like yeah. a mist that rises out of the like uh, little like, ponds or whatever. It's like mist and burgers. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's something else. Rainforest cafe. Go find Wait one. Wait for our new still... restaurant we're opening up later this year called Mist Burgers. <laughs> Has the essence of Rainforest Cafe. We're going to take down wall burgers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this or was, we just um, need to come up with a line of candles with that scent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mom, I got can- you. I got you Mist Burger for get, Ma- Mother's Day. Well, get on Twitter and suggest this to Rainforest Cafe. I mean, they got to like make money somehow now that they're all. They just changed go, to candles. I'm gonna go on eBay and see if there's any of their props up for sale. Yeah. It's- well, this was uh, Stan Winston was taken over because um, I think uh, you know obviously this was from the people who made Jurassic Park. Frank Mil- uh, Frank and Marshall was involved in Jurassic Park because uh, in Hollywood, Rick Baker was the go-to gorilla guy because he had done uh, King Kong in, in the 70s. He was the guy in the King Kong suit, and he'd also done, I believe, Gray Stoke, uh, The Legend of Tarzan, Lord of the Apes, and also uh, Gorillas in the Mist, I think. Like, Rick Baker was like, you need a gorilla, you go to Rick Baker. So this is Stan Winston trying to go like, no, Rick, this is how you do gorillas. And so here it you go. Good. Yeah. He what? did pretty good, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's story number one. We got to get the gorilla back right. to her native habitat. What's story number two? Story number two, we have um, Travacom, a massive communications company that has discovered breaking like new technology that will change the world of communications, and they have sent a crew into the Congo to gather uh, specific kinds of diamonds that make these laser guns, you know, which are crucial to communication, laser guns. Uh, This diamond makes them, (laughs) or powers them, basically. Um, And Bruce Campbell is among the team that is sent into the Congo, and then the team is then lost, and they need to go find them. Right. So Joe Don. So we have Laura Linney. Laura Linney is sent to find them. Right. Because she's, uh, I'm not entirely sure what her role is, but apparently she's good in the field aside from being an uh, expert in communications technology. She is sent there by her boss. That's Joe Don Baker shows up. Um, he was in Walking Tall and uh, the James Buford Bond Pusser. movies. That's right. He was the original Buford Pusser, uh, Brad Whitaker and all those Pierce Brosnan and James Bond movies. So he yells a lot and is just a fucking asshole boss who doesn't care anything about his son, which is Bruce Campbell, who got mauled by these creatures. He just wants the diamond. So he sends her in to go get the diamond. And who's the third interested party here? Tim Curry. <laughs> the, the incomparable Tim Russian Tim Curry. He's yeah. slumming it in this, man. <laughs> I what? think he's having the time of his life. What the I fuck think, is I going think it's on? Hysterical. I, I just it. think this movie's below him, that's all. <laughs> And so he was just like, I'm having guess- a lark at uh, at Amblin's expense or whatever, at Paramount's expense. What the fuck is... Okay, so he's... What's his name? He's he's a he's a murderer. Homolka. Say that again? Herkimer Homolka. Herkimer Homolka. He is a treasure hunter. Right. He's looking for... <laughs> what was the, the lost city of Zinj? Yes. Yeah. So he's you looking for... 
King Solomon's diamond mind, basically. This is Look the career I'm taking if I could have any career. Change my mind. <laughs> Tim Curry? Treasure or treasure, treasure hunter. hunter. Yeah. Yeah. I want okay, to be a treasure I, hunter. I take Tim Curry. I'll take him. <laughs> <laughs> I want his career. Yeah. Treasure hunter. I'd slash love to be in Clue. <laughs> Relic hunter slash tomb raider. That's right. Actually, um, he don't. His uh his character was named uh Hermaker after the actual mine that they took those gems from. It was the Hermaker mine in New York's in New York. Oh wow. They named it after me. Yeah. Well, he's supposed to be a Romanian uh gentleman, but he ha- I mean, come on, that's a Russian accent, right? It's a very it's Russian really accent. It. Or wait. Not Romanian. <laughs> uh, or is it because I mean, this is where I'm not because uh, Bela Lugosi, I always associate with Romania, but he was Hungarian, right? Maybe Yeah. Right. Well, so. he did say he did say something about in Russian Georgia. Yeah. So Russian occupied Georgia, maybe mm-hmm. is where like maybe it was Russian occupied wherever in Romania, where he's from. Yeah. I think That's he why just, he has the accent. I think he just mentioned lots of different countries so that it would make sense that we couldn't pinpoint it. Right. He's, he's like, it's mysterious. <laughs> yeah. Wow. His accent comes and goes like crazy, man. But yeah, it's like just, Romanian, Russian, Georgian, all of them. It's just goofy. Whenever you try to do, because he, I guess, is probably the most uh, unscrupulous, maybe the villain type of the movie. Yeah. Is he the antagonist? Honestly, I, I want don't, us to think that. I, yeah, I think that that was the intention, but I don't think he was that bad. Like, he... I don't know. He it he didn't seem like he was really intentionally putting anyone in danger or any like all, any of the things that normally come with being an antagonist. No, he's not sinister. Not like John no. Boyd. He's just like, hey, I've been looking for these diamonds my whole life. I just want to find them. Like, and he believes know. that the that. he believes that this um, enterprise to the Congo is going to take him to the diamonds. Why? I think he's just like Congo. Like, that's right. Here they are. I don't know. They don't get too specific. It's the eye. It's the eye. There you go. So, oh, right. <laughs> Look, we just watched this movie. <laughs> I know. I had to think about it. I'm sorry. Yeah, he's a ring, right? Yeah, he went yeah. on safari and found this ring with this eye, yeah. the open eye on it. The open eye. And he attends the uh, the thing that, you know, the what show and tell with Amy, and they show her paintings, and my God, she's been drawing this same eye the ape but the gorilla has been there and the gorilla will lead us to the treasure of the city of zinge that's right <laughs> okay all right so we're Lodge. with it so far yes so in order to accomplish this and so basically and laura linney is also like well this expedition's going over to africa so I'm going to hitch along uh, on a ride with them. I'm not going to tell them what I'm doing. I'm actually looking for my, because uh, Bruce mean, Campbell, it turns out, was her ex fiance. How serendipitous that these three parties are all go- wanting to go to the exact same spot in the Congo. Who knew? Yeah. Who knew? Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. Happenstance. Boom. So to get this there, shares a lot of things like that with Anaconda, I feel like. Remember how they just like happen across John Voight? Yeah, well, this, yeah, this is, does feel like the gorilla anaconda, and you could put that on the poster as well. There but, you go. but that's, I feel like that's too generous, even because anaconda is like wildly entertaining. Yeah, and there's it's more, what, and yeah, this was more it? fun. What? No, do we watch two different not. movies? Okay, you're gonna have to wait until later, baby. But okay, so we're there's putting, not enough gorillas. Well, yeah, but see, that was the thing. Like I said, it's your expectation going into this. Like the first time I went into it, I had a very different expectation. This time I was just kind of watching it going like, okay, Congo. And then it was like, oh, this is not a movie about killer gorillas. This is like a big sprawling adventure movie. It's called Congo because we're going to go to the Congo and all that that entails, which uh, first of all, you have to go get your guide. And that turns out to be Ernie Hudson. Um, does. That's right. Ernie Hudson is making his appearance on the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame tonight. <gasps> Yay! That's right. I was we, just thinking during this movie that we don't appreciate Ernie Hudson enough. I was too. I love Ernie Hudson. He's great in this. He yeah. is great in this. And this is and it's said that this is his favorite thing he ever did. Really? Yeah, it's his favorite performance. Well, all right then. Ernie Hudson, who was also in Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters 2, and Congo. We've done episodes on all three now. So congratulations, Mr. Hudson. You get the plaque, uh, the picture on the wall. On Welcome, the wall Hudson. Um, 
<laughs> Ernie Hudson Ernie was... Hudson C. Hudson. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, did you know that Ernie Hudson was in the octagon with Chuck Norris? Uh, That's right. There you go. Okay. I did not know that. Yeah. Uh, he's got his start in movies like Penitentiary, Penitentiary 2. Uh, he was in the octagon. He was in a 3D movie I like called Space Hunter with uh, Molly Ringwald and Peter Strauss. He was in Ghostbusters, obviously. Hand That Rocks the Cradle, The Crow, Leviathan. You remember Leviathan? Everybody knows Ernie yeah. Hudson, right? Ernie Hudson oh, yeah. in this movie is playing a role that was originally intended for... Holly, do you know this? What's this time? Um, no, I remember reading something about Hugh Grant for the main and, uh, Robin Wright for the main, but I didn't hear anything about who was supposed to be Ernie Hudson's character. Okay. Well, it turns out that Congo was actually written by Michael Crichton shortly after he did the great train robbery. In oh the 70s. yeah, I did use this. Sean Connery. He right? wrote it with Sean Connery. Yeah, it was going to be. So this whole thing to Michael Crichton, this was an updated version of like Alan Quatermain, the H. Uh, Ryder Haggard character, King Solomon's Mines, all that. So that's kind of where, right. you know, that's the feeling that you're getting off of this. This is a like. Uh, that's a, ironic. Well, how so? And that Alan Quatermain is the role that put Sean Connery out of business or made him retire. <laughs> In the so League of Extraordinary funny. Gentlemen. There you go. Yeah. Boom. It all turns <laughs> back around. It all comes together. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Ernie Hudson is, um, basically, well, he has a British accent. Again, this is just distracting, right? You've got Tim Curry doing Russian, Ernie Hudson doing British. Uh, he, I don't think it's supposed to be British. I got more of like a, a, like a South African kind of accent from him because some of the, some of the South African, um, territories can have kind of a British sounding accent. I, is it bad I think that that's I, what he was going for, I, I but I'm use, not, I don't know. I always use lethal weapon two as my like go-to, like that's the South African accent. That's probably bad. Sure, as you yeah. should, yeah. as you should. Um, Krugerrands, who knew <laughs> <laughs> currency? Um, so, so he is basically going to, so he's the hunter type, you know, right? Safari jacket and all that. He's been in the wild and knows how to survive. Uh, and he's going to take them through and negotiate their way through uh, the Congo, both through government clashes. We've got planes getting shot down out of the air by uh, heat seeking missiles once they mm. cross into um, Zaire. Right, mm -hmm. which could be which can be stopped by flare guns. Uh, yeah, this is brilliant, brilliant action scene. That's why I'm saying, like, you know, we're we've been spoiled by Tom Cruise movies because now you're aware <laughs> that they're on a set, you know, and it's a stunt person jumping out of the plane. Now you'd actually go up there and have Ch Tom Cruise like jump out of the out of the plane. Very true. Um, they're beset Tom Cruise by will probably get eaten by hippos as well. That's right. I'd be okay with that. There's a hippo attack in the middle of this movie with giant animatronic hippos. Um, <laughs> how, what'd you think about that scene? It was not great. Looking. I would have liked alligators or something. Yeah, it, it was. It was. It was very uh, Jaws ride at Universal. It very felt much. like yeah. It felt like a like um like a bad animatronic ride. Really, like, yeah, yeah, it I did. I know it's the the air blowing out, but it almost sounds like I can hear the pneumatic tubes of them moving <laughs> around and <Right>. stuff. <laughs> yeah. <it's... laughs> What's really disappointing about that is that hippos are actually like crazy dangerous and kill way yeah. more people than alligators. So yeah. use that, you know. But it's just yeah, the hippos are like the number one predator in Africa or something yeah. like that. Like yeah, it's crazy. So they and are also, terrifying. And also, they fart through their mouths. <laughs> That's pretty gross. <laughs> There you go. There you go. See, thank you, that's, Sean. See, that's a true like, fact. I'm learning something tonight I didn't know. <laughs> there, bam. All right. Um, they have to negotiate with the uh, corrupt Zaire government in order to uh, undertake this adventure. They meet Delroy Lindo, who I think delivers the greatest line in the movie. <laughs> it's my favorite. Yeah, so they have what to pay it, him off. It's stop eating my sesame cake. <laughs> well, you got to deliver it like he did, though. 
Did I? Did I not? Well, there's the screaming. Well, he yells it like you, you know. Want me to scream at you? Well, no. But uh, okay. Tim Curry, like <laughs> during this uh, very tense meeting where they're trying to pay him <laughs> off, is eating the sesame cake. Stop eating my sesame cake! And he yells it at him again. It's fantastic. Comes out of nowhere. To be fair, to be fair, he offered the sesame cake. He said, "Have some cake and coffee," and that's what Tim Curry was doing. Sure, it was kind sure. of rude, really. Well. They get set off on their journey. They also take with them, uh, oh, I'm going to fuck up his name, but uh, Adewale Akinoye Ajibaji, uh, yeah. right? Is that it's correct? An, yeah, it's an Oz reunion between him and Ernie Hudson. Yeah. 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 I remember uh, uh, Adewale from Lost, right? That was big. Yes. He was in the original Bourne movie. Um. So he goes Mr. along. Echo. Yes. We've also got Grant Heslov is part of the team. Um, a familiar he just wants to go home. That's the, She said he just wants to go home. I said he's Oscar winner Grant Heslov. Oh yeah, yeah. You'll remember him from like True Lies, but uh, yes. and Dante's Peak. Yes. Enemy of the State. Yes. Scorpion King. Okay. But he's oh, also, Jesus. yeah, he works with George Clooney and has uh, won an Oscar for Argo. And he's also produced like uh, Good Night and Good Luck and Ides yeah, of March. Produced yeah. and co- co-written a bunch of stuff. Yeah. 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 And, he's been pretty uh, successful. He's done some good movies. And he's mm-hmm. basically uh, the science guy on the on the team. Um, so they're going to go in. I don't in. see science anything. Well, so what is he doing? What is he, his function? He like? works. He works with Doctor Elliot. He he's one of Amy's keepers. He works with him. He's not really a out in the field kind of guy. He's like a classroom kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this movie uh, explodes with action. There's all sorts of action. They're playing. Well, they don't get shot down. They jump out. They have to parachute out of the plane because it's being shot at. Uh, they land in the jungle. Um, then they have to find their way to, is there a beacon or something that's directing them up to the, the volcano? Yeah, she's, tra- she's basically tracking the signal from the equipment from her team. Laura Linney is tracking this signal from the equipment from her team that got lost there or yeah. killed or whatever. They don't know yet. And this is a good, like, I mean, I think I checked at some point because I was like, wait, I thought there were gorillas in this movie. And it was like, we were more than an hour in and there were no gorillas. And I'm like, okay, this is a very different movie than I remember it. Um, the idea being that the the hidden city of Zinge, Zinge? Zinge. Zinge, yeah. Is protected by, it's actually on the land where these, um, like, mutant or inbred gray gorillas they are warrior gorillas. Yeah, all like fucked up in the face, probably because yeah, through fights and whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're protecting it, so they kill anyone who comes by there. And that's why no one's ever discovered this place where there's just diamonds lying on the floor all over the place. Um, the movie builds to an exciting climax that not only has uh, an attack by gorillas that's fended off by a laser weapon. We got freaking lasers in this movie. Um, but there's also a volcano eruption at some point and the whole mm. like set explodes and people have to jump across flaming lava rivers. Wasn't some there's some kind of thing going on with like why were, earlier on why were they setting up camp like in the middle of a stream? You remember when that happened? Uh, that was like the montage of like we're going through the jungle and we're coming across all the elements. I, I yeah, it did seem like they set up a tent in the middle of a stream. I don't know. And then it got right, washed that, away. That had my favorite line of the whole movie because it didn't make any sense but that was when Ernie Hudson says with a moon like that every monkey for 200 miles thinks he's Elvis Presley Where, was that supposed to be like what are we listening to and it's the sound of monkeys fucking in the jungle or something what yeah. the, okay yes why was that yes. important why did we need to have that scene we didn't but it's, more, uh, it's, it's trying to give you the the taste of Africa and I say taste <laughs> <laughs> they really hit us over head over the head with it in the intro, though. The music, the shots of the animals, like God, I get it. Yeah, the movies called yeah. Congo for fuck's sake. Well, there was also well, that's what they uh, want to do. They want to show off the Congo. In, a, in well, in addition to that amazing scene, there's also a song and dance number. No, it's not. But it's uh, California Dreamin' is sung by I think the entire like cast at some point. 
uh, as they're trying to, what are they they're doing? They're like knocking Amy out by feeding her a yeah. drugged banana in order so they can, I can't remember, were they, were they going down the Travel river? Travel easier, or? basically. They were going on the, the whitewater raft thing. Yeah. Because they're trying to... Monkey flew in a plane, no problem, but white runner rafting is a no-go? Well, they had to knock her out on the plane, too, and for the parachute uh, ride. Here's my question. They gave her a martini on the plane, which we glossed over. That's right. (laughs) We glossed over the fact that he offered her an egg in this trying time first, and she threw it. (laughs) And then she demanded... They offer you an egg in this trying time. (laughs) Is that what you called a green drop drink or something, right? the green drop drink. I thought he... Oh, green, green drop? I thought it was a raindrop drink. That's why it oh. didn't make any sense. But green, green drop, assume, that yeah, makes sense. Martini. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. And that's apparently a, a routine of hers. She likes her martinis. Shaken, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's the... Okay, so if we're looking at this movie, like, what are the what are the character arcs, then, that we have to resolve for maybe these three plot lines, right? Laura Linney has to find... Bruce Campbell, who we know is dead based on the origin, the, the beginning of the movie, right? He was attacked by the gorillas. Uh, yeah. And yeah do, so, we ever, do we ever think that we were going to find him at some point and not be dead? It was kind of underwhelming for her character, I think. She's like, there he is, laying in a pile dead. Right? Yeah. Right? I mean, that's a problem, right? When it's just kind of yeah. like, oh, there he is. And it's like, wait a second, this was the guy who's your ex fiance He didn't seem to care a whole lot about it, except that he was my ex fiance and we got to go find him. He's your son. We got to go find him. And then she yeah. finds him. He's dead. Okay, but at least he got the gizmo, the whatever, the priceless diamond that powers the laser weapon that we're going to use to blast our way out of here. Uh, uh, Tim Curry, basically, he just has to find the diamonds in order to satisfy his whole thing right like, find the lost city of zinge and then as these movies do it's like well well you shouldn't have gone there anyway because nature rebelled and killed everybody and there's a you know the whole place explodes um right. or you remove the grail from the building and gorillas kill you you know right. that whole yeah story <laughs> and for, and some gorillas just jump into lava for no reason yeah what was going on there because uh, were yeah. they committing suicide <laughs> I did, it see, like. I, d- I did see that, like, some of the ones that were jumping, there was, like, fire, like, shooting out from behind them. So it's like yes. they were trying to get away from the fire, and they just, there was nowhere else to go. That's yeah. what I figure. And so they yeah. had to jump into the boiling lava. Um, it was pretty hilarious either way, honestly. <laughs> and I guess for Amy, she just has to get back to the the valley and Nature. meet up with the good gorillas. But, like, did you feel, and this is why I'm wondering if this movie had an excess of characters did you feel that like uh anything that uh what's his name peter her handler or amy did actually contributed to the plot in any way not really probably not otherwise it would have come to us a little sooner um no because like there's no dramatic tension between him and Lorlinia. I mean, she's on a completely different mission than this guy. This guy and uh, his love for Amy. It's like basically at some point he's going to have to let her go, or she's going to leave, and there's going to be a big dramatic teary moment as the ape or god damn it, as the gorilla goes off, you know, to live with the other gorillas. Um, but I mean, no- other than other than like her, um, Amy was the key for Tim Curry thinking he found the key to the lost city. Mm. I mean, there was that connection. Did you get the impression that Amy was actually leading them to it? Really? I mean, they, I mean, obviously Laura Linney had her like tracker. So she kind of knew the direction they were going, but then there was a point where she, where like there was malfunctioning and she was like, I'm going to follow the gorilla. Like she literally said that. So that was when the movie kind of did service to it. It's like, well, Gorilla's taking us there. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, the main force of the movie seemed to me to be, it was Ernie Hudson and Laura Linney seemed to be the two characters that impacted the plot the most. Uh, Tim Curry's kind yeah. of along for the ride and like, you know, we know what his goal is to get there, but he's a tag along. And then it made uh, Peter and Amy, they're also a tag along. It's yeah. like Laura Linney is like I know we where we're going. With Laura Lenny. 
Yeah, and Ernie Hudson is like, I'm the guy who's going to get you there. But the movie's so yeah. fucking like weirdly confused and uh, uh, schizophrenic in a way that it can't mm-hmm. figure out that like, okay, these are the main characters of the movie. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. I always find it weird in movies when they do that. It's like uh, your dramatic action is being controlled by people other than the main character. Well, there was something else we watched like three or four weeks ago where it was like, had four people in it and two of them who are the stars were just like there. And the other two were the ones who are actually guiding the plot. But I don't know. Maybe that's just me. It kind of felt like it. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, but, uh, I mean, you know, we stick with, stick with Laura Linney. I'm back on right now. She's, she's driving it. Yeah, no, she I is. Guess. It's her and Ernie Hudson are driving the yeah. plot because she has to find. She has to get to the because we've got to find Bruce Campbell and the thing that he found because that's going to power this communications technology with which involves satellites because it's a '90s movie. We got to have the CGI satellite shot and the Comlink room where everybody's sitting around, uh, you know, computers watching the amazing uh, futuristic technology available today. I'm talking uh, on a video screen. Yes. Um, <laughs> We're doing now. I feel I'm, it's like Congo right here. <laughs> well, there's also a scene that's very high tech uh, where, of course, once our camp sets up in the middle of the jungle and they were attacked by the apes, they set up, which I always love these scenes, right? Which is the we're going to camp at night, but we got to set up the perimeter defense scene. Yeah, this is the alien yeah. scene. This one seems extremely overwrought. Right? I mean, this goes back to, like, Forbidden Planet. Hey, that's another movie that we also did an episode on that you can go back. But, yeah, you got your guys in the middle, and they set up there. Colin's always selling. (laughs) Right? We got a catalog, back catalog. Go check out (laughs) other episodes of the Saturday Night Freak Show. Um, So, yeah, what what gizmos do they have here to to keep these gray gorillas out? Uh, Lasers. On the bar. On the, yeah, it's all lasers. We have perimeter lasers and laser and uh, it's like uh, a the, the guns on tripods and stuff. Yeah, like, like like automatic. Yeah, um, I love automatic those auto like, Gat, like Gatling guns. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they got trip wires and all that stuff. So you got mm-hmm. motion detectors and we got thermal imaging, so we can see in the dark. Oh yeah, very exciting. How'd the yeah. scene come off? How was it? <laughs> Like a, a gorilla rave in the middle of a jungle. <laughs> yeah. Kinda. I mean, it was kind of fun. I kind of liked it. <laughs> Did you guys feel, um, and this is another thing I think that 90s movies have, uh, maybe it's part of, it's the 90s stank, right? All the jungle scenes, for the most part, feel like they were shot indoors. Did you also get that? <laughs> yeah, it always feels like it's too bright. Yeah, I wondered that several times if it was on a set instead of out in the jungle. But yeah, because you can control it, and you can sculpt the landscape, and the red cave at the end looks very fake. Uh, the temple scene that they go into—it's like all these uh, right. '90s directors always shot and covered this stuff the same way. I mean, it looks like Stargate, or you know, um, you could say it looks like a rainforest cafe. Yeah, it does. It kind of does. Yeah, it kind of does. Yeah, the or sun Tomb Raider is always. Area shining in from the right direction <laughs> through the leaves. Yeah. Which makes me feel like this is a, definitely a set. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much was, I know they did actually film in the, um, the Republic of Congo. So yeah, I no, don't know how much of it was on a set and how much of it was outdoors, but I know they actually did film in the Congo. Yeah. Cause there's several scenes, obviously the Bruce Campbell at the beginning, there's a lot of outdoor establishing shots as they're going up mountains and walking through the jungle. There's, yeah. I believe the scene with, there's a second plane, um, that, that crashes that shot down that they go to see the, uh, wreckage of, and that's obviously outdoors. That whole scene, I didn't quite understand because in my mind, uh, the, the logic that got me there was, um, Laura Linney is giving a, uh, a telebriefing to her boss, Jodan Breaker and, uh, Amy runs across the camera and tips it over, which of course to him looks like they've been attacked by gorillas, just like the first crew, right? Shortly yeah. after this, a plane is coming overhead and gets shot down by a uh, heat seeking missile. <laughs> 
Sean's very tired, apparently. Tonight. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, drinking coffee. I'm so sorry. And so it crashes in the jungle. They go to see this. I mean, this is an expensive thing to set up, right? They got a flaming fuselage laying there. Do we ever find out whose plane that was? It's all no. for the balloon. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, because I thought all this to get a balloon on the island. I thought it was maybe like this was the the second team, right, or the third team, right, coming to find them. Like we're going to relieve them. We're going to go find them. And so he sent another team. And this is never explained. Just another plane shows up and gets shot down. Just so, I guess, like you said, it has an emergency escape balloon in it that they can leave during the eruption, the final eruption of the volcano. Right. That's it. You'll never catch me in a hot air balloon. No, that doesn't never. seem like a good idea. <laughs> so yeah. much can go wrong. How do, you, how do you land that fucking thing? I don't know. It's just it's, you, 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 wait. you. Yeah, you, wait. you lower the That's gas good. down. You turn the gas down and just slowly <laughs> hope you slowly You can descend. ask your pilot. You can look at your pilot like, hey, so uh, when's this over? And he's going to shrug at you because he doesn't know either. <laughs> you have to wait. <laughs> Fuck that. If the so, wind's really know. bad, that basket's going to be flying around. If you run nope. out of gas, you're fucked. There's so many things that can go wrong. Not at all. Never. You can only kind of sort of steer what direction you're going. Yeah, up or down. Yeah, mm -hmm. they seem very, it's a very small little basket that you're in. I mean, that it's freaks like, me out too. Yeah, it's open. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Never. Some people no. want to do all this crazy shit. Like, not when a volcano's <laughs> erupting, it seems like an especially bad way to make an exit. Especially because there's <laughs> lightning and there's ash in the air and it's fucking up the wind, you know, direction and all yeah. that, wind velocity and all that. It's big. And you want to get out of there quick? Yeah. <laughs> But Where's they the do. fucking helicopter, man? They make it. This is after they've <laughs> said goodbye to Amy. There's a very tearful moment where Amy gives uh, Peter, uh, picks some flowers and gives it to him. He keeps those flowers Aww. with him on the balloon. He's always holding on to the flowers. It's like, man, you guys are, you, you've messed up like where you're. Uh, focus is supposed to be here in this narrative somehow. It's, yeah. like, it's a love story between a guy and a gorilla. Yep. That's all I wanted. <laughs> Was it the unconsummated <laughs> love story between it's not a I wanted at all. and a gorilla? Yeah, eventually. The she moment, goes back the to moment her. when, the moment when Peter sees the male gorilla and says, "Huh, handsome fellow," and he's jealous. I'm out. Yeah, that's I'm out. Too much. <laughs> yeah, she's like, "Well, so what if he's handsome?" <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, her asking, asking, saying "tickle me" all the time was already really disturbing, and this just really pushed it over the edge. Tickle Amy, tickle Amy. It's like, yeah. No, no, Amy, I'm not gonna. He does though. You take that shit elsewhere, Amy. He does tickle her though. That's the that's the thing. He indulges all of that. I know. These are the stepping stones to shape of water. All right, so I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna. Tell you if you should watch Congo. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to have to answer some of your mail. And to do that, we're going to have to recruit our mailman. His name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Thanks, Igor. We oh. need to get Igor one of those gloves. We do. That would be great. <laughs> you know, I mean, just only know how to say. Masters, like, masters. Right. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. And he's got to read that off a cue card every time. Like, he can't remember it. <laughs> True. We uh, would have to teach him sign language, I guess. So maybe that's not the best investment. Yeah, yeah good, good teaching him sign language. <laughs> right. Uh, Colin, I'll pay you five bucks if you can somehow get that creepy Amy voice to do uh, the mail <laughs> intro for next oh <laughs> That would be that awesome. Would be I'll look into it. I'll see how many hundreds it. of thousands of dollars I have to get. What was it? Uh, Tricom? To lend it out to Travic us. Tr Travicom. Travicom. There you go. Travicom, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we hope that you'll uh, write in. We'll read some of your mail here. Join the Freak Show family to do so. All you got to do is follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Giant Freak Show. Or Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or follow along on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. Oh, uh, I forgot to mention. Uh, we also... 
and this might be a point of contention on the Saturday Night Freak Show because the actor involving spookies. No, it is involving the Wall of Fame, and uh, I know we keep saying it's the Sylvester Stallone Wall of Fame because he has how many? Do you remember appearances? Seven. Okay, so Peter Jason is an actor who has been. He was in this movie. Blink and you miss him. Uh, but he was like uh, at the beginning somewhere. I can't even remember. He was like an official who helped them with their luggage or something. Well, that I don't that that's a stretch to count. Oh, no, that. Because I can't Peter, even remember who he was. But well, I don't I remember his face, but it was a small role. Peter Jason is in like every goddamn John Carpenter movie ever made. But apparently Peter Jason has now been in nine, nine Saturday Night Freak Show movies, including Congo. He was in Mortal Kombat. He was in Escape from L.A. He was in Angel. He was in Streets of Fire. He was in They Live. He was in Arachnophobia, In the Mouth of Madness, and Village of the Damned, all movies that we have covered on this show. Thanks to Emma. That was a Mad. lot of Sean movies. <laughs> <laughs> and that was. Yeah, I was surprised when he was in Angel. I was like, oh, shit, it's Peter. Right? Like, he was uh, one of her clients. Uh, in Mortal Kombat, he was, um, what's the guy? Not Johnny Storm. What's the fucking, the, I don't know. Johnny man. Cage? Johnny Cage. It was his sensei. You remember? And he turns into, uh, uh, not Lopan. It's a fucking, I don't know my motor. Shao Kahn. Shao Kahn? Yep, there or, you go. Yeah. Wait, that's, uh, is it? Is it Shao Kahn? I remember Raiden. Oh, yeah. I always, are... I always think I'm saying Shere Khan from fucking Jungle Book. Yeah. Shao Kahn. Okay. Let's go with that. So anyway, Peter Jason now on the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame nine times might be. Uh, it might be the Peter Jason Wall of Fame. He may have been Jeffrey think, Combs. Uh, I think Stallone's had more of an Stallone. impact. Uh, Stallone's had more of an impact. Just going yeah, I think you have to have starring roles for it to be your wall. Name's got to be so. above the title. Oh, yeah. yeah. These, are, these are, again, bylaws, ladies and gentlemen, bylaws. Um, anyway, MF Mad, uh, who's the keeper of the wall, he also wrote in and said uh, about Congo, he said, this movie and Clueless were probably my favorites back in the summer of 1995. I don't think I've yes. seen this movie once <laughs> since the 90s, but I can't wait to revisit it. What a double feature. Yeah, oh. <laughs> well, John McDowell says, after watching Jurassic Park while I was in middle school, my best friend and I started reading, reading Michael Crichton books, and Congo was our favorite. We were so excited about the movie getting made, and then we saw it. We're still friends and still talk about the disappointment of that experience. <laughs> yeah, Jurassic Park it is not. Because that no. was two years prior to this, right? So it was like hyped yep. up as like from the maker of Jurassic Park. Congo. Mm-hmm. Michael Whitaker yeah, says, I, "Oh, sorry." I, was like, I don't. I don't know a whole lot about the book, but I've heard that the book is kind of boring. So, I mean, I don't know. But. Well, my husband said because he's read the book and he was watching this with me. He said that yeah. the book is actually legitimately good, and he found it to be scary. And he was he was much more angry at this movie than I was when we were watching it. He's <laughs> like, "This movie sucks. It's so stupid." <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, Michael Whitaker writes in, he says, after reading Jurassic Park, I thought I'd be interested in Congo, the book, and I was wrong. It's definitely a ridiculously stupid movie, but at least focuses on the more interesting parts of the book. Throw in a little Bruce Campbell, laser guns, and the gorilla with an incredibly unnecessary robo sign language gloves, and it's mildly enjoyable. (laughs) He hit the highlights. I mean, yeah, when you cherry pick those things, it does sound like an interesting movie. Right. Jacob Laws says, I remember liking it as a kid, but I recently read the book, and the book is way better. Hmm. There you go. Interesting. Travis Legler says, what did I think of Congo? Not enough Bruce Campbell, and he dies off way too fucking early. However, if you've ever heard him talk about making the movie, it's an interesting story. Hmm. Hmm. That's it? You're going to leave us on that cliffhanger? (laughs) I looked it up, and he basically said something to the effect of, like, you know, imagine that somebody says Frank Marshall, who's worked with Steven Spielberg, is directing a movie. You get to go to the Congo. Laura Linney's going to be in it. Ernie Hudson's going to be in it. Tim Curry's going to be in it. And it turns out to be Congo. I think that was the gist of, (laughs) yeah. Uh, Yeah, yeah, Bruce Campbell auditioned for the role of Peter, but... That would have been so much better. Yeah. 
better. That might completely change how I feel about this movie, honestly. Yeah, yeah. it's like a, it's a very, gonna... what do you say, milk toast kind of, yes. uh, yeah, uh, leading yeah. guy. Uh, this was back in the era where Bruce Campbell was on the cusp of becoming like a legitimate big Hollywood star because he had also auditioned for The Phantom and got, uh, he was between him and Billy Zane. And we know how that went. Right. That would actually be an improvement on that movie as well. Oh, you shush. I well, like that movie. There's Billy a Zane's lot great. of love for uh, Bruce Campbell, it turns out, because Brent Zemecki says, I wish Bruce Campbell had been more than just a glorified cameo. That man is a goddamn legend. Everyone wanted this to be a Bruce Campbell movie. Yeah. Didn't you didn't? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it would have been did. better. Like I would rather <laughs> see him like I want to see him. I wish young we could get young Bruce Campbell back like this age yeah. and this put him in a in guy. a jungle a jungle yeah. adventure movie. Yeah. Yeah. That that you can't just tease us with Bruce Campbell like that, you know? Yeah. Like at least Intruder had the decency to make it a cameo at the end of the movie. And Darkman, where he just shows up. <laughs> yeah, and Darkman, too. At the literal very end of the movie. True, very true. Uh, Nicholas Capriola writes in and says, Oh my God, this movie messed me up as a kid. And then when they threw the severed head, that whole scene, when it runs down the steps and charges them, he's talking about the uh, gorilla. That's right, there's a severed head. Who got killed? Whose severed head was that? A dude. Because I know no, they um, slashed up Grant Heslov, but they threw Claude. somebody else's... Okay. I don't it was know. Claude. Yeah, I was like, it was one of the other guys. I think it might have been Claude. Okay. Claude from Mombasa. Yeah. Oh, Claude. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good morning, Nancy. Podcast says, "Oh my God, my husband had very fond memories of the movie, and I kept telling him it's not as good as he remembers, but I didn't stop watching it. <laughs> and yep, it's awful. That gorilla talking is hilarious, and Tim Curry is at his cheesy best. Best to not revisit those things that live in your memory so well." Well, uh, talking about revisiting things in your memory. Last two weeks ago, we watched a movie called Invasion USA. That's right. Get ready. Here it comes. Well, no. Uh, uh, it came already. A listener called Mo- came. Moinga said, I love this episode. This movie is in my top five. So there you go. Brace nice. yourself. Bill Hainer says, Chuck Norris built the hospital he was bu- born in. Did I say that one on the podcast? I don't know. I thought I said that one on Nelson the podcast. Nelson Nascimento said, Chuck Norris didn't cry when he was born. The only one crying was the doctor. No one slaps Chuck Norris. I think they're reading out of the same book I am. Simon Carter says, little known was fact. That book, was that book jokes from 2005 that we've all heard before? <sighs> yeah. Have you heard this one? Same okay. Book. Chuck just Norris checking. died 20 years ago. Death just hasn't built up the courage to tell him yet. <laughs> Chuck Norris right. never flushes a toilet. He simply scares the shit out of it. Come on, that was a good one. That was a good I've one. I've heard of like all, that. Colin. Okay. They've been around for 20 years. <laughs> this is the hazard of bringing a Chuck uh-huh. Norris movie on the Saturday Night Freak You're Show. You're the only one who's yeah. done it. You get yeah, right like, now we're having a Chuck Norris aftertaste. No, yeah. Holly did it too. Yeah, That's I right. did it too. Sorry. Three well, weeks oh, yeah, of I guess, Chuck Norris. I guess, you know, honestly, weirdly enough, I do, almost don't consider that a Chuck Norris movie just because it's such a weird fucking movie. <laughs> That's okay. Neither do I. I am. All right. So now we're going to go around the table and tell you what we thought of Congo, starting with Michaela. Michaela, what did you think about 1995's Congo? Yeah, so pre- I had seen it before, and previously when I thought about Congo, I remembered the Nintendo Power Glove, and I remember Amy just, like, forming ridiculous, hilarious, broken sentences with it. Specifically the, like, ugly woman, Amy thinks you're ugly, all that stuff. Like, And I remember that being hilarious. I remember the inappropriate relationship between the, the two of them, but I mostly just remember, like, the tickling. I didn't remember how far they took it. <laughs> um, it's it's unfortunately there's so much other stuff going on that I don't care about. It feels like it takes them forever to get to the location and they just hit so many snags on the way that I don't care about. You know, if you're going to cash in on Jurassic park, at least just copy the formula of Jurassic park, you know, uh, it's, it's, it has really hilariously entertaining moments, but it also has just like a lot of stuff in between. that's just really terrible and not very entertaining. So I think I'm going to have to pass on Congo. I don't think it's really worth what you know the gorilla stuff isn't worth sitting through all the other stuff how if you remember like i did you thought there was gorillas way more in this all the way through 
it's not really even about the gorillas so much. They're kind of an afterthought. So, yeah, not going to recommend Congo. Sean? Sure. Um, uh, man, did I used to watch this a lot back in the day. Um, <laughs> uh, it was on HBO all the time. They did used to do um, behind the scenes called HBO First Looks. Um, it was like 15 minute segments in between movies where they'd show you how a movie was made. They don't do that uh, anymore? Anaconda too. What? They don't do that mm-hmm. anymore? No. HBO first look? Man. And if they do, it's not called that. Not it's not like it was back then in the nineties, man. Yeah. Was, back then it was, it was back then it was literally like between every single movie they would do those. Yeah. They were yeah. great. I used yeah, to love it. It was like whole... it was like early film education for a time Yeah, it for sure. Cool. I think the Fox um, movie channel, you remember that? I think that used to do that too with all the twentieth century Fox movies. Probably. Yeah. I'm sure everybody had kind of that same idea. Um, but uh, uh, so I watched that a lot and uh, I thought it was uh, fascinating. Um, and I really liked this movie when I was younger. Um, watching it again today, and I haven't watched this in forever. Um, there are, a, I remember there not being a lot of gray gorillas in this movie. Um, uh, it's great when they come along. Um, I'm pretty okay with this movie. Um, I'm not going to give it a glowing review. Um, but I'm also going to recommend it cause I thought it was just, uh, uh, kind of like a fun little jungle adventure movie. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, I'm pretty okay with this. I'd show it to the kid. Um, it's definitely for a younger audience, I think. Um, but I think there's enough in there to kind of, you know, kind of enjoy. So again, it's not, uh, uh flying colors, but it's good enough. So I'm going to recommend Congo. Colin. Yeah, I think under I'm going to file this one under guilty pleasure. Uh, my expectation, I think, the first time was colored by the, the like Michaela said, the advertising tells you it's you know they're going to go to the jungle and then they're going to be beset upon by angry gray gorillas and that's the movie. And then you go there and it turns out that's not the movie. Well, this time I had forgotten all of that. I knew that there were gorillas in there somewhere. So this time I was kind of just open to like, okay, so what is the actual movie that they're uh, you know, that they're giving us. And then I'm like, okay, so this is a, this is a, you know, one of those pretty decent sized budget nineties action movies that you really don't get anymore. Um, I'm not going to say like, I, I think it's better, especially the eighties versions of these, right. Or the seventies versions, something like uh sorcerer where you actually go into the jungle or the eighties predator where you're actually in the jungle. And here it's like, well, it's a contained soundstage adventure, you know, it's very safe and, you know, so it's not as good as those, uh, you know, the older techniques of doing it. I did think that the, the ape uh, animatronics are pretty cool. I don't think that, you know, Amy serves much, uh, to the plot, but it's like cool that, you know, well, she looks like, you know, kind of looks like a gorilla and the gorilla has got like a main role in the movie. Uh, I think there are problems with the plot that I've described, but I did have fun with it because it, it's always moving and there's always stuff happening. Uh, it just, it's the destination. It turns out not to be as important as, uh, we think it is going into the movie. It's more about the adventure that they're going to get on along the way you know the tribe that they're gonna meet the uh whatever when they find uh what's his name was in this movie um joey pants yeah those are, yeah joey pants was in the movie too joey pants is in this movie yeah but john hawks i was thinking of when they find oh, john yeah. hawks and they have to try and bring his spirit back into his body and there's an attack by a <laughs> snake at some point they may have slashed the head off a real snake and there's all sorts of stuff happening in this um it made it an, I was entertained and I was entertained by some of the over the topness of it. You know, uh, people just you know, with their goofy fucking accents and uh, screaming lines at each other and the weird and improper relationship between the trainer and his gorilla was like, what the fuck are you doing? So, I mean, I was entertained, right? I'm not saying this is like a four star movie or anything, but uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think I would recommend this as a you know a perfect way to pass an evening and have fun with Congo. Uh, Holly, what would you think, Congo? I think uh, Ernie yeah. Hudson. Um, sorry, I'm gonna. I think no, Ernie no, Hudson fine. does a lot for this movie. Well, like, you know, I'm oh, thinking yeah. about his yeah. casting. I'm like, the only thing that I got a problem with Ernie Hudson is that character seems like he would be more athletic than Ernie Hudson. <laughs> If you know what I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't. I thought I thought it was 
I don't really know where you're going with that. I thought he was fine. Well, for somebody who's like hacking through the bush and all that stuff, he seemed like he was kind of like not well, in the big, best shape. He's a big guy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. But, he's yeah. a big guy. And I don't think he's hacking through the bush every single day. See, I think I he is. Think I, he's I, more I, of a little... Jamon Hansu type for sure. Yeah, I think he would. Yeah, uh, I believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like that I like guy's the, going. I like the fun he has with it. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like him for it. Um. Yeah. No. I. I'm. I think I'm on the same page with you guys. This is. This is more of a guilty pleasure kind of movie. Um. I hadn't seen it probably since I was a kid. But I like Sean. I used to watch it a lot. Um. I think it's. It's. There's definitely a nostalgia factor in it. Um. But it. It is a fun movie. It's just ridiculous and silly and it's it's got a lot of things that i like you know i like i like a nostalgic 90s movie i like that there's a laser gun at the end that laura linney wields and kills a bunch of monster gorillas she's even got a lion in there she's with them on the endangered species list (laughs) right like i like the cheesy like 90s action elements like that i you know the whole like crescendo of the invasion of the camp when all of the guns start going i thought that was fun um i think ernie hudson's great in this ernie hudson is probably my favorite part of this movie i think he's fantastic um i know everyone talks about tim curry being so funny and he was he's really funny but ernie hudson is like my star in this um i thought he was great um (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I agree with what Michaela was saying, that there are some slow parts that I didn't remember being so sluggish when I was a kid, but they did move a little slow for me in this watch. Um, but I still had fun with it. I still thought it was a good time. Um, I think it would have been better if Bruce Campbell had been had been Peter. I think that would have brought a, a much more fun element to this because um, I think Peter, like Colin said, was pretty forgettable. His it wasn't anything he wasn't really necessary besides the inappropriate relationship with a gorilla. Um, but overall I thought it was fun. I had a good time with this. Um, like Sean, I'm not going to give it a glowing review, but I'm going to say, yeah, it's a fun movie. And I, I think you should watch it if you're in the mood for a little nineties, weird nature action movie. I think it's fun. I like the, I like Tim Curry's storyline of being like a treasure hunter looking for a lost city. I'm a sucker for a treasure hunter kind of movie. Like I, I love that shit. I wish there was more of that stuff. Um, we haven't had a good one in a while and I wish we would. Um, but yeah, I I think it's fun. It is all over the place. It is messy, but I don't know. There's some good stuff in it. I think it's entertaining and I, uh, I'm going to recommend Congo. Yeah. Why not? Well, if go. Bruce Campbell had been the lead in this movie, it'd be a cult classic. Yeah, it would. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. But that's hindsight, I guess. Like they don't, they fucked up. Hollywood fucked up by not making Bruce Campbell a star. <laughs> you know, absolutely. It was the indie scene that did. You know, and well, there you go. I mean, he had Bru- uh, Briscoe County Junior was probably like closest he got to like real mainstream success. Yeah. Because um, even Burn Notice became a success, but it doesn't feel like that was like you know super mainstream it was like it was on usa or whatever yeah it was like somehow was. still getting new seasons but everyone was like who the fuck watches this yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so well yeah. there you go but unfortunately now he's retired ash but maybe he'll come back who knows evil dead four right i need evil dead four i'll okay. be praying for it till it comes there you go <laughs> all right uh so next week uh we're gonna watch a movie that's chosen by Michaela, uh, Michaela, what sort of uh, incident are you going to bring us into next week? <laughs> All right. So our summer blockbuster failure event rolls on next week with 20 teens after Earth. Oh, oh no. no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, it might no. not be fun, but there's a lot to unpack. Oh, I'm no. laughing at Colin and Sean's instant reaction to that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. I haven't seen this movie. Well, what do you what? I've seen it. That's why I'm saying, oh no. Why are you saying that? Because I know it's history and I know it's reputation. Oh, I boy. don't want to watch it. Holly, you seen it? <laughs> I've not seen it, no. Okay, well, then there you go. All right. All right. This Alrighty. is M. Night Shyamalan's After Earth. This is the movie I think that uh, they didn't put his name on. No, it was like, like he was there for the day to day direction of it, but it's mostly Will Smith's vehicle. We'll get into it next week. The, the history behind the movie is far more interesting than the actual movie itself. Okay. This well. is going to be, um, a, uh, considering we have a lost episode, is this going to be the first M. Night Shyamalan movie we bring to the podcast? 
It could be because we we didn't we, do six cents, did we? We did signs and yeah, it's a did, lost yeah. episode. We did signs and a guy eaten by the gremlins. Did. Yeah. You didn't you didn't do the village? I don't mm-hmm. think no. I was think I was thinking you did. And we're like four hundred episodes in at this point. I don't know. I can't yeah. even remember what we've done. But nah. I don't think we did. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, that's okay. next week on the Saturday Night Freak Show. We hope you'll tune in. Thanks for sticking with us this long. Uh, we're sorry for the Skype, uh, you know, gremlins. And we'll see you next week, boys, boils and ghouls. The basement is going dark.